Hey, how can I help you? I'd like to try and sell this Colt revolver. This is cool. Do you know much about it? I know it's an old piece. I want to say 1800s. This is a very early Colt single action army. This was, uh, this is 1870s. And everyone wanted them. And they also had the world's greatest advertising campaign. God made all men and Colt made them all equal. <laughs> I came down to the pawn shop today to sell my Colt revolver. I don't know much about Colt revolvers. Mine looks old and I'm hoping it's worth a lot of money. If I'm able to sell the revolver today, I'll probably just take the family on vacation, maybe a cruise or something. The Colt Single Action Army really was just incredibly revolutionary. I mean, this this was the most high-tech thing around in the 1870s. Before this, it was, you've seen the old movies, them, you know, packing the guns with gunpowder and putting a ball in this. This had cartridges. This was super accurate. This had interchangeable parts. This shot straight. It didn't break. I mean, it was just a high-quality gun. And this is an incredible set of grips. We have a Federal Eagle here. You have the shield, the lances. These were twice as much money as any other comparable gun to them. This is the dream gun of every Colt collector. If you have ever seen a Western, you've seen this gun. I want this thing, I want this thing, I want this thing. But I have to make sure everything checks out. So where did you get this thing? I'm a bail bondsman. And somebody put it up for collateral, and they never paid off the bond, so they surrendered it. This is an appraisal on it. I took it in for $25,000. That's what they owe. That's what I'd like to get. OK. Um, and they're saying an obvious factory reversal of the numbers. It's often the case with arms engraved and nickeled. So you want $25,000 for this? Yeah. Do you mind if I have someone take a look at this thing? I mean, I just have a lot of questions on the gun. I mean, it's really weird that you have two serial numbers on the gun. But if everything checks out, maybe we can make a deal. Great. OK. Hang out five minutes. I'll get him down here, and um, we'll go from there. OK. Oh. Um, wow. It's a pretty neat gun. <sighs> My big fear with things like this is usually when it's too good to be true, it's too good to be true. What do you think? I mean, at first look, it's, it's gorgeous. What's really nice about this is this is a known pistol. This has been in two books, and one of them is the Colt Bible. So it's a single action army, seven and a half inch barrel, which was the standard cavalry length. The single action army changed everything. I mean, this is the gun that won the West, also known as the Peacemaker, the Colt 45. I mean, this started it all. Cool. The grips are the thing that makes everybody go, wow. You see this here, this high relief? These are Civil War scenes. Colt didn't make that grip. Uh, there was a retailer. The largest retailer of firearms in the United States was Schuler, Hartley, and Graham. This style grip is extremely rare. It, you see it more on older pistols, percussion pistols. But on a single action army, this grip is, these are hen's teeth. All right. But there's some really weirdness with the serial numbers. <laughs> Most Colt collectors go, I want all matching serial numbers. Uh, but I think it's a pretty fair assessment to say, look, these were hand stamped. They were making them thousands and shipping them out. And that could just be a simple mistake. It could drive the value down a bit. But there's so much right about this beautiful gun that, you know, for me, it, I would still want it. So we have an 1876 really fancy Colt. You got a piece of magic here. OK, so what is this piece of magic worth? I would say that at auction, I would safely guess that this would sell for 35000 If it went above fifty, it wouldn't really surprise me. Wow. I was thinking it was going to be a little bit less than that, but I'm not surprised. I mean, it's a beautiful piece. <sighs> OK, well, thanks, man. You are welcome. Appreciate it. OK. Thank you. This gun is an excellent buy for the shop. The model is known as the Peacemaker, but if Rick can get a good deal, it'll be known as the Moneymaker. All right, so 25, no problem. Amy, what's your best price? You give me 40,000, I walk out the door. No, you're, you, if at 40,000, you're walking out the door with the gun. Even though you can sell this for 55, 60,000 here. No, 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 he says maybe.
35. I go 26. 27,500. Gun's yours. We got a deal. Great. I'll meet you right over there. Honey, pack your bags, because I'm taking this 27,500, and I'm going to take the whole family on vacation. What do we got here? Led Zeppelin one signed by the full band. By the full band. I only see one. Jimmy Page signed the front, and on the rear, John Bonham, Robert Plant, John Paul Jones. That's pretty amazing. I've never seen, you know, Led Zeppelin sign an entire album. Jimmy, being the leader of the band, refused to sign the back. This was his puppy. Yeah, Jimmy Page is now the one uh, begging Robert Plant to play. <laughs> when Led Zeppelin came around, this band rocked. It was like Take No Prisoners. There's probably 24 authentic signed Led Zeppelin albums in existence. So I'm looking for $22,000. Hey, this is really amazing. Led Zeppelin is one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time. Every one of their albums was in the top 10, and six of their albums were number one. Now, four signatures on an album, if this is real, I probably won't want to put it in the store. I want to bring it home. <laughs> the big question is, how much do you want for this? 22,000. As far as Led Zeppelin collectors go, this is the holy grail to Led Zeppelin items. My huge concern on this, mm -hmm. We got Jimmy Page on the wrong side. But you're not going to find something like this. So have you ever had it, the signatures checked out? Uh, yes, it, independently, yes. Uh, let me call up my friend, take a look sure. at it. Of course. He really knows his stuff. So hang out for a few minutes. Sure. I'm going to go give him a call. Maybe we can do something. Yeah. I understand an expert being brought in, but I don't buy things that I have doubts about. But you know, it, it is what it is. Good to see you, man. How are you? Doing good. Good. How Hello. you doing? Nice How to see you. you. This is it. This is what I called you about. The greatest rock band of all time. Yes, they yeah. are. They're the guys who really, you know, gave everybody else their inspiration. Well, trying to put together a signed Led Zeppelin album is really difficult. Uh, John Bonham died in 1980. Robert Plant, uh, John Paul Jones, Jimmy Page, they're not really that accessible. If the signatures are good, if everything checks out, there's no doubt this is going to end up being one of the rarest items I'm ever going to see. The big thing is, are they real, and what's your opinion on what it's worth? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, Rick, is look at it under magnification. Right there, ballpoint pen. Um, and you take a look right here. Oxidized, it's a little older. You know, you could tell. Nice aged ink. So we know we've got live ink on here. That's a great sign. The next thing I want to do is take a look at the examples I have on file. The Robert Plant signature is something I take a look at all the time he would just flow through the signature. He had this big R, and then the rest would just become all a big flow. But I want to go back to the bottom signature. Whole name is connected, and he's doing the same thing here. John Paul Jones, probably the nicest signature in the band. The last one I want to take a look at, the Jimmy Page. And that, again, is just all over the board, but I love this flow and spontaneity. OK, so it's all legit. Based on everything I've seen, absolutely no doubt this is the real deal. Sweet. And what do you think it's worth? It's rare as hen's teeth, OK? These things just really don't exist. The only thing that kind of bugs me a little bit is the one signature on front and the other guys on back. But with that said, I put this value right at about ten to $12,000. OK. Way off. <laughs> And no, with all due respect, Absolutely. You know, I understand you're a signature person. Yeah. You're not really an appraiser. Uh, no, I, I, I actually take that. Okay. No, I, uh, I actually see. I've been doing no, this for about 25 and, and, years, no, so no, I've seen no, a lot. I've okay, seen no, a lot of I, autographs I, I, I and totally material. I'm not trying to. And I get where you're coming from too, but at the same time, um, I've seen plenty of these pieces. Uh, yeah, I've done a lot of research on these through the years. Uh, yeah. Okay, I, you know, I respect your opinion, yeah. but you know, we all have opinions. You, you do realize that Jimmy signed, the reason why Jimmy didn't follow suit with the other three is because this was his baby, this album. He Absolutely, signed the front. Exactly. I'm not, no, I'm no, not no, actually know, discounting not, any no, of that stuff. Right. One second, I'm not discounting any of that stuff. I would tell you this much, that if you told that to the average person, mm -hmm. they're not gonna care. They want them all on the back. Thanks, man. Yep, good luck. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yep. Thanks, talking. Yep. Cheers. If I'm a collector, and if I'm someone looking to buy a high-end collectible, and especially to spend a huge amount of money, I'm going to want all those signatures to be together and be displayable. Unfortunately, this wasn't all together, and that kind of takes away from that total value.
I would give you eight grand for it. I, sorry, we're, you know, again, miles apart on this. You know, I mean, what's your best price on it? My best price uh, would be 17.5. This is, this is history. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd go 8,500, but... No, I, I'm sorry. You know, okay. I appreciate the offer. Okay, well, if you change your mind, come back. The offer's open. No. Um, have a nice day. Thanks Thank for coming you. in. Thank you. Thank you. People are naive. It's opinions. Everybody has opinions. This will sell. I have no problem selling. I just think that they really need people that know what the hell they're talking about. I know what the f I'm talking about. This guy is an ass. Hey, how can I help you? I have a coin I think you might be interested in. Okay. It's a steel penny. Are you familiar with those? Yes, I am. Whoa. It's a 1944 steel penny. That is really neat. I know there's less than 100 of them in existence. Oh, from my research, there's less than 30 that exist. Okay. You know, I know a pawn shop and I deal in a gazillion different things, so yeah. I, I can't know everything, even though my kids tell me I'm a know-it-all. <laughs> I'm coming to the pawn shop today to sell a 1944 steel penny. This is a very rare coin. It was given to me as a gift for my 70th birthday. I know I don't look 70 years old, but I am as old as this coin. It's amazing. This is a really, really weird coin. This coin doesn't, isn't supposed to exist. It was. Uh, That's correct. You know, World War II happens along. I mean, just everything was rationed. Bacon was rationed, and you know, the U.S. government came along and says, "Hey, you know, we make tens of millions of pennies every year." Basically, told the U.S. meant you have to make cents out of something else because copper is a war metal. So they started making, you know, the cents during 1943 out of steel that were zinc plated, and everyone absolutely hated them. People were confusing the steel cent for a nickel or a dime. dime. So in 44, we stopped making the steel pennies. But when you're making tens of millions of cents, you know, they were steel bins and stuff like that. And they think that like some of the blanks got like stuck in the corners and things like that. And when they were pouring them out into the machines, a few of these got made. This coin is one of the great mistakes of the US Mint. And in general, when the United States Mint makes a mistake on a coin, that coin is going to be worth a lot of money. How much are you asking for this? $102,000. Whoa. Uh, I am going to call on a friend, look at this thing over 100%. You know what I mean? For, for 102%. 102%, yeah. <laughs> um, this is pretty amazing. Um, these 1944 steel cents and the 1943 copper cents are probably the most famous errors of the 20th century from the United States Mint. And you would not believe how many people have dug through mounds and mounds of pocket change trying to find one of these. Because if you find one, it's a gold mine, and we're looking at one of them right now. There you are, yes. So how many of those actually got out into circulation? Well, that's a big question, because these were struck at all three mints, Philadelphia, Denver, and San Francisco. They struck, oh, it was something like two billion cents in 43 and 44 at the three mints. And the total population of off-metal strikes is about 60. And most of them were struck at, at Philadelphia, like this one. Okay. May represent something like half the known population. However, it's still a rare coin. Yeah, and there's only 30 of them out of a couple billion. That makes yeah, it pretty rare. Yeah, it's a very rare coin. So what do you think this would go for? Approximately $30,000. And- That seems awfully low to me. It's a public auction, both well, of them. That's okay, but yeah. you don't necessarily have to bring this coin to a public auction. No, but public auctions are actually where the most realistic prices are set because every major collector in the world gets those catalogs because there's, these are high-profile auctions. There's many sites mm -hmm. that value that coin a lot higher right. than that number. That, but okay. the, the auctions are, are very clear in determining the value of these coins. Okay. All right. Have a good one, Dave. All righty, thanks. The value of 30000 for this coin is extremely low. This is probably one of the rarest penny coins in existence. I don't know where the expert came up with that value. It is what it is. If this thing, I would give you like, I would give you 25 grand for it. No. I'm not sure you know what you have here. Well, I know exactly what I have. Oh. I have something that I could probably sell between thirty and $35,000. There's none for sale, though. There's none of these for sale. This is the one. OK. I, this, is the only, this is the only one in the state of Nevada. Um, 
maybe, but it's still what it is. What slow should go? You know, I I drop it down to the minimum that it's valued at about seventy-five thousand. Not going to happen. Then we will not be able to make a deal. I have a good one though. Thanks for stopping by though. No problem. I think the offer of twenty-five thousand dollars is ridiculously low, but I'll just keep it in the family, and somebody eventually will sell it for a lot more than I'm being offered today. How can I help you? I have an antique Chinese fingernail guard. Oh, you're gonna poke someone's eye out. Be careful. Better be nice. <laughs> Let me see here. Doesn't really fit me, but, <laughs> but what better way to let him know how high class you are by a... <laughs> True style. Not so tacky, long silver fingernail. <laughs> oh, this is pretty cool. You don't know like where it's from or anything? It's from China, and I think that it's the Manchurian era. Yeah, it, it does go all the way back to there. And this is exactly what the women would have wore, who were, you know, high class, and they wanted everyone to know. Yeah. yeah. This is silver, you know, so... It's beautiful. Yes, they wore these to show they didn't have to do manual labor, to show that they had servants. And I guess the longer your nail was, the more servants you had and the less manual labor you had to do. So I don't even think this lady had to get her own glass of water. Probably not. <laughs> fingernail guards were worn to protect the long fingernails of the elite during the Qing Dynasty. This is a pretty amazing artifact from the time period, and I definitely want to make a deal. Plus, maybe I can get some use out of it and convince Rick I shouldn't have to work. I wouldn't want to break a nail. What were you trying to do with it? I'd like to sell it. How much are you looking to get for it? I would like to get $250 for it. Would you go 100 bucks on it? No, I don't think I could go $100 on that. That's... Is it, any... I mean, it's beautiful. Look at all the workmanship it on is. it. Would you go 200 on it? Would you go... 240 on it? Um, you know what? I think I'll buy it from you. Just hopefully my boss will be proud of me. OK, good deal. All right, let's go write it up. OK, great. Yo, check this out. What is that? What do you mean, what is this? It's a finger guard. Is it for picking your nose or something? You know, rich ladies wear them so they don't have to do any work around the house. So I was thinking about wearing it so I don't have to do any work around here. Where's it from? It's from China. It's for ancient empresses in China. How can you tell that? Because I know it. I've seen them before in a book. Now I know you're lying. Well, the internet, same thing. How do you know it wasn't made yesterday? When you've been around as long as me, you just know. How much did you spend on it again? $240. So since you didn't ask me before you bought it, I'm sure you called Phineas. Why would I call Phineas? Did he even ask you about it? This is the first I'm hearing of it. Corey don't know anything about this. Neither do you. That's why you should have called Phineas. I know I made a good deal on it, that's for sure. Stop waving it around. It's really creepy. Will you go call Phineas and tell him to come by and take a look at it? Hmm. I guess I can. Oh, then it's broken. Yeah. <laughs> Is that Phineas? Hey, how you doing, Chumley? Woo! What's up, man? Wow, that's quite a fingernail you got. But, Check it out. Wow, this is amazing. Told you. Rick thinks I messed wow. up. Well, you know, I find this very interesting because it comes from a, a period in China's history. Boom, China! And this was worn by people in the court who absolutely did not want to lift a finger to do anything. So can you imagine? This is just that's one I, finger. That's what I said to him. Sorry they, to cut you off. They had one of these for every single finger. You, it's rare that this is in silver. Silver was, you know, almost more precious than gold, which would make me feel this could be a very special one, probably very, very high-ranking court official, maybe Chushi herself. Boom. Score really for Chum. amazing, amazing. Don't leave me hanging. It's pretty. I mean, I just it don't know is. what it's worth. Well, I'll tell you. Did you get a good price? Two hundred and forty dollars. Two hundred and forty. Well, I I'm gonna say probably bidding uh, in the right kind of auction house. It could go 
to $750. $750! That's $500 profit. Just admit that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to leave you two with this piece to nerd out on it. I hey, got you know something? You did pretty do. darn good, my friend. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm proud of you. At least someone is around here. Well, you'll put that away. Uh, I don't think he's going to be doing much work in that condition, Rick. I'm, Thank you. I'm worried. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Everyone's got their burden. Hey, how's it going? Good. So what do you have here? Pennsylvania oil field, 1870s, 1880s, wooden barrel with gargoyle advertising. It's really, really cool, because most of these were returned for their deposit. Uh, it's also weird to me that that's called a bunghole, by the way. I... You know, I had to say it. That's what that's <laughs> called. That's called a, you know... Yes, it's... it is. It is a bung. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to try to sell my Pennsylvania oil field wooden barrel with gargoyle advertising on it. In my opinion, it's one of a kind. I've done seven years of research and cannot find anything equal. I'm hoping to get, you know, 50 grand out of this thing. Who knows? I mean, it, it's deeply cool. You know, the world was basically dark before 1859 when they found oil in Pennsylvania. They didn't have pipelines or anything yet, and they didn't have steel barrels or anything. So this is what everything was transported in. So when you went down to your local store, you would have a rack of oil there. And um, that's why this would be out like this. And you buy a gallon. This is the vacuum oil company, and you have the gargoyle here. The vacuum oil company didn't start using the mobile oil logo until 1899. So we know it's right around that time. Mm -hmm. Vacuum oil company eventually became mobile. Yep. Which is now the biggest oil company in the world. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a really neat piece of history. You don't see a lot of these anymore. It's the only one I could find. How much do you want for it? You only get one of these a lifetime, in my opinion. I'm going to tell you 50 grand. That's a start, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, hey, that's definitely a start. Well, uh, hey. We all got to start somewhere. That's right. Um, <laughs> um, I think you're asking way too much. OK. Um, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I'd give you a 1000 bucks for it. I mean, it's, it takes up real estate, dude. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, and it's super cool, but I got to resell it. I'll tell you what, two grand and it's yours. <sighs> it's worth every penny. You know that. Can we be in the middle of 1500 bucks? I'm in. Sweet. I'm in. This That's is cool. cool. Let's go do some paperwork. I'll have my yes, guys sir. grab it. OK. I'm settling on $1,500 because it is 10 times my money. I bought it for 150 bucks. That's a home run to me. What have you been doing? I bought a standard oil barrel. So what, it's like a 55-gallon drum or something? Oh, no, 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 because you have to remember, uh, an oil barrel is 42 gallons. Well, 42 American gallons. A gallon can be two different sizes, depending on what part of the world you're in. I don't get how a gallon could be a different measurement in two different places. It's a gallon. Well, no, there's imperial gallons and there's US gallons. No, there's gallons. No, gallons are bigger in England. Like, our pint is 16 ounces, and over there, their pint is 20 ounces. Do you get it now? Yeah. No, I don't. You weigh less over there, because they use kilograms. Still just as fat. <laughs> hey, Rick. Yeah? There's this motorcycle out back. You should take a look at it. Is it cool? Yeah, it's really cool. OK. That's shiny. It's an original 1969 T100C competition model. It's absolutely beautiful. I love it. I wouldn't I... be selling it except my wife's making me sell it. <laughs> <laughs> this Triumph is one of the very first dirt bikes, and most of them were beaten to death. This bike looks like it's been restored right. I've always loved old Triumph motorcycles, so <sighs> I'm gonna have to contain myself. <laughs> Tell me, uh, how much do you want for this thing? I've seen these go for as much as $25,000. They're just kind of where I'd like to settle. Do you mind if I have someone take a look at it? OK. I'm not nervous about uh, an expert's opinion or anybody else's opinion. The bike is perfect. It speaks for itself. Mercy be, that is something special. Brings back memories, buddy. That's the <laughs> yeah. way it was. 
The history behind these kind of things, Rick, is just unbelievable. I mean, Elvis Presley at one time bought every person, his crew, one of these bikes. That near fatal crash that Evil Knievel had jumping down there at Caesar's Palace was on a Triumph. Wow. Everything Triumph is today is, came from these bikes right here. Very, very special. That is definitely cool. I'm Mark Yule of Freedom Eurocycle, and I'm an expert in Triumph motorcycles. So is it all original? This is a very rare bike. It, this is a C model T100. Those were the ones that were the most sought after, especially now by collectors. You know, as I look over this bike, simple little things like the foot pegs, they are right. I look at all the switches, the housing, the headlight. These tanks still today are hand pinstriped. It's a pleasure to look at something like that, knowing they're still maintaining that today. The upswept pipes on it, very, very rare piece. Very few of them left. Pretty special bike, Rick. Okay. So what do you think it's worth? Somebody that was an avid collector of these motorcycles right here, I mean, they might pay $30,000. But realistically, it's in that $20,000, $25,000 range. Something like that is really what this bike might be worth. All right, this is really cool, but... Would you like to take it out and ride it? That might yeah. sell you on it. <laughs> I don't need to ride this bike to make this deal, but I'm going to because I can't. <laughs> I'll give you a call if I buy it. Thank you, Rick. Nice meeting you, sir. Good luck. Thank you. Finding a 1969 Triumph Trophy 500, it's so rare. This is a motorcycle I think that would fit in the store here but I would like to see Rick keep it for himself. Here we go. Nice. Awesome. This bike rides like a 1969 motorcycle. Actually a little better than most 69 motorcycles. It handles all right. It doesn't have a lot of power. The suspension sucks. But damn, I look good on it. <laughs> I'm in love with this bike. I really, really hope I can make a deal on this thing. What do you think? Pretty snappy? For a 69 bike, yeah. It's like a brand new bike. It is. So, Amy, anyway, what's your bottom line? I'm still talking 25. I'll give you 14 grand. Now, I'm not gonna lose it for 14 grand. I mean, it, what is your best price? I'll come off my 25, 20 grand. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 15. I mean, it's a fair price. I mean, if you put this in an auction, you know, by the time you pay the auction fees and everything, you know what a nightmare the auctions can be. 17.5. It's a really cool bike, I don't get me wrong, but I think as far as business goes, it will be hard for me to even sell this. 15 grand's it. You drive a hard bargain, Rick. If it wasn't for my wife making me sell it, um, I'd stick to my guns. 15, I'll do it. Sweet, um, let's go do some paperwork, man. Okay. Um, this is great. I'll make my wife happy. I'm gonna settle for $15,000 for the bike, and then I'm gonna buy another motorcycle. I just hope my wife doesn't find out about it. I brought you one of the most positive and uplifting books I've ever brought you. Okay. The Dance of Death. It's a book from 1547. It is really cool. This is basically a bunch of pictures of death coming to call. Back in the 1500s, if you lived like 50 years old, you're ancient. <laughs> I came into the pawn shop again to see Rick to sell my copy of the famous Dance of Death. That's magnificent in the way that the images and the text sit on the printed page. I mean, it's a book from 1547. For a book as beautiful as this, I think collectors from all walks of life are going to be interested. Oh, this is pretty amazing. It's all woodblock prints, right? Yeah, it's illustrated by woodblocks. It's actually done by Hans Holbein. He was one of the most famous artists of the Renaissance. He was the court painter to Henry VIII. It's a very interesting work. It kind of grew out of the Black Plague from the 14th century. How much do you want? Well, for the dance of death, I don't want to kill you over the price, <laughs> but I'm looking for 10 grand for it. 
$10,000. You know what I do when you come in. I'm going to call Brie Becker and have her come down. Oh, yeah, of course. So let me get her down here and um, see what she has to say. Yeah, have her look at it, though. Okay. All right, be right Sounds back. Good. Thank you so much. I'm really excited that Rick is going to show Rebecca. She's always reminding me about condition, and this time I've brought her a beautiful book in beautiful condition. She's going to be really excited to see it. I hate to do this, but something morbid awaits you. <laughs> um, yes, that is the book I told you about, The Dance of Death. Pretty neat, huh? It's amazing. It's beautiful, and Rick, this is officially my favorite book that you've had me look at. It's very, very interesting, and I know a little bit about it. Well, this comes out of the 14th century in particular. Really bad century for humanity, at least for Europe. I mean, not only the Black Death, but famine. And as a result, you get this culture that starts looking at their mortality differently. Death is everywhere. We're not getting away from it. But on the other hand, while we're alive, we still need some amusement. We need to enjoy ourselves. And the dance of death kind of rides that line. Some of these scenes are kind of funny, too. Look, Rick, I found you. <laughs> Look. See the merchant who's all upset that death's taking his money? Yes, yes, that would upset me. <laughs> I love this book. It is one of the most important works in the history of book illustration. The images in here are timeless. They're beautiful, and they speak to the human condition. I have a few questions. It's been rebound. Yeah. But obviously, it's rebound very well. It is. And the original cover would have probably been wasted anyway, right? Yes. Ideally, you would love to have it in contemporary binding, but whoever bound it, they'd spend money on the binding, then I wouldn't consider that a deal breaker. OK. OK? So what do you think it's worth? OK. Um, the early 16th century, there are a number of editions. So this isn't technically the first edition. That said, today, these are really hard to come by. Yeah. I think that, I think you could get up to 16,000 for this. You Ooh. could, you could even, maybe even get more, honestly. Okay. okay. Impressive price, I like that. I get visitation rights. You have visitation rights. Okay. If I buy it. Okay. <laughs> I really hope Rick buys this. And honestly, I don't care if it's at a good price, he should just buy it. And then I'll have to figure out some way to get it from him. So you take nine grand for it? Look, I'm not a person to haggle, really. We do a lot of deals, but I love this book. This is really one of the finest series of Renaissance illustrations. Let's just go down the middle. To 92? Don't bury me. <laughs> <laughs> 95 down the middle, it's a fair price. If a Rebecca is that enthusiastic about this book, I can guarantee you're gonna find people who are even more enthusiastic about it. I have bought a lot of books off you and I've made money on every one, so you got a deal, man. Done. Okay. $9,500 for the book. It's really close to what I asked for. I'm gonna take this $9,500 and instead of focusing on death, I'm gonna be celebrating life. What do we have here? An ugly piece of artwork. Okay, so it's done by... Snowden. M.L. Snowden. Mm-hmm. Got it from a former in-law, and I'd like to get rid of it, just like I got rid of them. All right, all right. That, that sounds like you're a little bit bitter. Mm, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. I sort of like it. I know about her. Um, M.L. Snowden. She's in her 60s. She's been doing this ever since she was a little kid. She worked with her father. Her father was a um, pretty famous sculptor. It's not the art everyone likes, you know what I mean? Some people like a little more, more traditional or a little different, but she is a really famous artist and a lot of people like her work. I mean, she's uh, won a ton of awards and she actually owns some of the tools that Rodin used and she uses those tools when she sculpts stuff. And it's signed in the sculpture there and it's 14 up 25. Do you know the name of it? No, I don't, but you can buy it and call it whatever you'd like. <laughs> Even though I'm not familiar with this exact piece, I've seen a lot of Snowdens before in galleries around the country, and they can go for a lot of money. And even though it's not the art for everyone, I gotta admit, I sorta like it. It's neat. I mean, how much were you looking to get out of it? $50,000. $50,000. <sighs> um, normally, I, I got a friend who I usually call the expensive artwork, but um, he's out of town. 
it is nice. This is very collectible. People love this stuff. Um, I'll tell you what. I'll give you 20 grand. Deal. I'll take it. Whoa. <laughs> that was easy. Okay. Um, 20 grand. All right. Thanks so much. I just massively overpaid for this. Let's go do some paperwork. Sweet. All right. <laughs> Well, I was actually pleasantly surprised with the negotiation. I seriously thought I was going to end up with like five grand and walk out of here disappointed. Um, but I'm very happy with the 20 grand, and it's going to be well spent. Chubb. What? Let me get this thing off the dolly. What is that thing? It is a statue, obviously. Grab the other side. What in the hell is this? It's an ML Snowden. What did you pay for it? $20,000. Why? No one's gonna buy this. No, your dad just bought it. Yeah, there's a sucker born every minute. No, son. Uh, most people aren't like you two that have a picture of a Ferrari with naked girls on it. That, that don't yeah. have that, but I have good art. Can't we just grab the other side of it. No, I'm not touching it. Just I, pick up I, the I, other side. Sorry, dude. Have fun with that. I'm out. No, Chubb. Dude, I don't want to. Just touch pick that. it up. You're grabbing its legs. Uh, damn. Oh, we're gonna need some more help. Corey and Chum seem to think that they're absolute geniuses and know so much more than I do. So I'm calling in Chad just to show them that I know what I'm doing. So what do you think? Wow, ML Snowden. That is Photon from the Elements of Light series. Okay. Yeah, I got it off a lady, and I paid her 20 grand for it. I figured I couldn't go wrong. Wow. That's, now, this piece, this series, originally sold 58, 60,000. Okay. Now, she parted with her publisher, so a few pieces have come onto the market. All right, the big question, what's it worth? Because I paid a lot of money for it. Uh, I would put this one probably at about 36,000. Okay. But the thing about Snowden is, this is investment quality art. And this kind of stuff, it's only going to go up. $36,000? I think the market will bear that, yeah. Hold on one second. Corey, chum. Rick paid $20,000 for it. I think that's a fair market price. I think he can do much better than that upon selling it. But he definitely, he didn't overpay. Chad thinks I can get right around $36,000 for it. You want to buy it, Chad? No comprende. Uh... <laughs> yeah, we still have to sell it. It's, it'll sell. Well, you it's... guys are not exactly interior designers. No, we're more of a yeah. beer crowd, not a fine wine crowd, and it's still ugly as hell. Yeah, it's, I am a good interior designer, and I would not put that in any interior. It's horrible. They'll never get it. They're well, not art lovers. Chum's idea of art is a velvet painting in a black light. <laughs> hey, how's it going? How you doing? So what do you have here? This is the earliest documented paper money from the Ming Dynasty, China, 1368 to 1399. It's uh, called the uh, Wan Quan note, which is basically 1,000 cash. There are two notes in there. That's why you're seeing two different shades. OK. I mean, it's pretty cool, dude. Governments have always tried paper money. The problem is with paper money, there's this massive temptation to keep on printing more and more and more. And you start getting inflation, and the right. next thing you know, what used to cost a buck cost 100 bucks. It's the inevitable keep on printing until you destroy yourself. <laughs> I got these notes from a seller whose brother passed away. I really appreciate Chinese currency. It's one of my favorites to collect. I would like to get, for the better condition, probably around 12500 and the lesser condition note, probably $8,750. So how much you want for them? Well, the better condition one, 12500 The lesser condition, 8750 OK. Have you had these checked out by anybody? No, I have not had checked out. Had notes checked out one time. They were gone for over two months. Cost a lot of money. I mean, I can call someone in to take a look at it. Definitely. You know, um, a lot of times when it's too good to be true, it usually is. Um, hold on a few minutes. I'm going to go give him a call, and uh, I'm going to get Ben here. OK? OK. Thanks. Having an expert come in, I'm very interested to see what he has to say. I'm strictly a collector. I have not been doing this an incredibly long time, so I'm excited to learn everything I can about these notes. 
Um, he's got printed Chinese notes. Wow, you know. look at that. Wow. Um, he says they're from the 14th century. Well, you know, it's so fascinating to me to take a look at ancient Chinese currency. And there's a guy in history. That's the guy who invented paper. Oh, His really? His name was Sei Lung. And he actually invented paper in 105 AD. He used maciated bark. He used old fishing nets. He used rags, boiled it all together, and it turns to paper, right? right? So it, it kind of changed the world. Sure. I've seen examples of currency that go all the way back to 250 AD. And back in those days, money was used almost like an IOU note. It basically would say, I owe you two amounts of silver, and then I owe you seven coils of copper. And that way started currency. As I'm looking at this, uh, with my expertise, this is Ming Dynasty, mm -hmm. okay? You flip this over, and right there, that tells you how much money's involved, okay? You've got two big drecots of silver, and this is gonna be copper. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, drecots of copper. This is the emperor's seal right here. So I can take one look at that and say that's emperor Yuan, this is Ming. So you've got two different pieces of currency in here. Yes. So is it real? What do you think, Chun Li? Does it look old to you and 750 years old? Not as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> Not You're quite funny. 750 years. You're really years. funny. <laughs> well, handmade paper that came out of that dynasty, and it's come over my desk at the university before. It usually is more frayed. It's got a thicker texture to it. And, and handmade paper, it, it, there's no consistency to it. it, it it's kind of like, you know, rough looking. Well, I'm just gonna say, based on what I've seen, I cannot say that this is real. It, it kind of looks too clean, hmm. uh, too new to be 700 years old. I understand. All right. Thanks okay, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're basically looking at paper that's 700 years old, and by the time it would get to my desk, it's very frayed. This stuff looked like it came off the press yesterday. So it really did throw up a red flag with me. I mean, maybe there's a slight chance and a really slight chance that it's some way legitimate. Old paper like this, it's, um, it becomes brittle. Interesting. I mean, you can send it off to a currency grading company and maybe for some weird reason they were like this, but I really doubt it. And I appreciate it. Have a good one, man. You too. Thank you. Well, I definitely am disappointed they feels they're not real. I'm not sure if I agree with them. I'm not sure how many of these have come across their desk. Hey, man, what do we got? This is Madonna's personal daily planner and phone book from 1988, filled with unbelievable phone numbers, dates, all completely handwritten by Madonna. So where'd you get it? When I was 12 years old, I snuck into her hotel room and I stole it. Really? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I came to the pawn shop today to sell Madonna's personal daily planner and phone book from 1988. This is something I purchased at a very reputable auction house. And this item is a great Madonna artifact, but I think the time has come for me to pass this on to another diehard Madonna collector. This is really something I've never seen before. She's got music video dates and personal people's birthdays, Cher's phone numbers in there, Jane Fonda, Warren Beatty, Dennis Hopper's phone number, Bruce Willis, Pee Wee Herman, the list goes on and on. Did she sign it anywhere? Or? Her name is actually right here in the front of the book with her phone numbers that she had at the time. And you could see this is in her handwriting where it says Madonna. She's got music quotes. She's got little hearts around Sean Penn's name. She was married to Sean Penn at some point, wasn't she? She was. So it wouldn't surprise me if the two of them get back together again. I think Sean Penn has always been Madonna's true love. I don't know that much about her, but Madonna has been a huge star for decades. And a lot of people consider her the queen of pop. And she does have some mega fans out there that would pay good money for this. So how much are you looking to get for it? I'm asking $25,000 for the book. Really? Really. When it comes to something like this, I really don't even know where to start. I'm going to give a uh, buddy a call and have him come down and tell me if this is our handwriting, because I, I really don't even know what to say about this right now. I would love to see what he has to say. I'll be back.
I don't feel that it requires an expert's evaluation. I know how legitimate and how great this item is. This was something I had to have. I love Madonna, I think she's amazing. Vogue, Vogue, Vogue. Madonna's day planner? Ah, cool. Obviously, Madonna's kind of a big deal. She's really difficult to get near, tough autograph. Uh, she doesn't like signing. She doesn't like people just being around her. Because of that, her value is insane. She's like one of the most valuable modern era celebrities that's still alive. All right. What are your concerns? Uh, dude, I don't even know if it's hers. It just looks like a bunch of gibberish from, from a high school girl. <laughs> I, I really don't even know what it is. This will be uh, challenging here. Um, the thing I have to do is, because we're not really basing it on a signature, I've got to check her handwriting. Um, obviously, I have to compare her writing compared to the stuff I have. She had a way of writing, a lot of lowercase letters, mm -hmm. uh, cursive, some printing, some mm -hmm. block letters. I'm looking for transition points on her S, and you could see it where she wrote shirt here and Sean. It's literally the, the same, same thing. S. And she takes her S here, and she brings it straight up. That's a positive sign. Just kind of looking for matches, and I'm looking at the four, and looking all lowercase here, and looking literally at the same exact letter four. formation. Yeah. Her R's, interesting, her transitions here. Again, I see the same type of R here. You know, based on everything, though, I'm seeing here, Corey, it's from her. Uh, and it's pretty cool, if you want to know the truth. It's a really neat piece of memorabilia to have. Is it actually worth any money, though? Yeah, she's one of the biggest stars of all time. What's it worth? You know, what I think is interesting about this piece is that it hasn't really been circulated in a long time, and it's kind of a personal piece of hers. So it's got a little more than like a signed photograph or an album. So conservatively, I'd say ten to $12,000 range, right in that ballpark. I disagree. Okay. Well, I, I, I definitely <laughs> think it's worth a lot more. I've been offered a lot more than that, but, you know, we all have an opinion. Of course. I appreciate you coming down. Yeah, good to see you. Yep. Good luck. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you, man. Yep, you bet. I think it's a great buy for the shop. Finding a personal effect of hers, like a date planner, or talking about a rare item. Anything Madonna has significant value to it, especially something that comes right from her. You're asking 25, heard my guy say 10 to 12. I'd give you like four grand for it. It's insulting, to be honest with you. It's worth a lot more than that. I'd go down to 20. I'd go to five. We're not gonna make a deal, are we? Listen, we all make mistakes in life. Madonna's day planner isn't gonna be one of mine, I promise. Well, we'll see what happens. I appreciate your help. Take care, man. Thanks, man. This was worth clearly over $20,000. It is a iconic piece of rock and roll music memorabilia, and his, uh, his offer was insulting, but that's okay, we all make mistakes. Hey, what do we have here? Well, sir, this. Oh, obviously it's a gun. <laughs> Figured that out. Yeah. Clever this one is. Uh, sir, what I have today is I have the British P1871 Martini Henry short lever rifle. Okay. Very iconic rifle. This is another weird bizarro desk with the English. You know, they were still putting bayonets on rifles and doing rifle charges in World War I when they were running into machine guns. Not a good idea to do a bayonet charge. <laughs> That's the last stand. That's the last show of courage there. <laughs> I initially received the rifle from my great uncle in 1990. This weapon here, I have no use for it. I'm hoping for $1,250. What I'd like to do is I have a race gun I'm trying to put together that'll provide a new magwell, new trigger system, and a new optic so I can go run a three-gun competition. This thing is pretty cool. This was the rifle used by the most powerful army in the world. This was used by the British in the Zulu War when they, when they fought the Zulus. Mm -hmm. um, can I put this on? Absolutely. Let me help you out. Yeah, okay, so this would go like that, and then like that. There you go. And then this would. <sighs> that is just gnarly. You're ready to charge the hill, sir. <sighs> yeah, not me. <laughs> In the late 1800s, the British government offered a prize to gun manufacturers to come up with a new rifle for the British Army. But after years of testing, they liked part of the Martini and part of the Henry rifle. So they decided to come up with a hybrid, and they called it the Henry Martini rifle. I guess it was a tie or something like that. <laughs> it's in really, really good shape. Um, how much you want for it? Well, sir, I was looking for $1,250. Do you mind if I have someone look at it? 
I mean, I it, it, I mean, the thing is, sometimes you, when you come across these things, there's things that make it really exceptional, and there's some things that mm -hmm. um, are bad. So um, I'll get a little more info, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good to me. All right, I'll be right back. Let me give him a call. An expert coming in, I'm fine with that. No worries whatsoever. Any other input can only help me sell this rifle. This is a Martini Henry rifle, which I think you know. This is the first mass-produced breech-loading infantry rifle that the British Army ever adopted. The action was so well designed because it had the striker, the firing pin, integral to the drop box action. So with one motion, when you drop this, it actually ejects the cartridge and recocks it. So now you're ready to fire again. OK. One of the nice things about this one is it's dated 1872. And you see how it's that Roman numeral there? This actually was originally one of the first ones made in 1872 as a Mark I pattern. And then in 1876, they brought them back and improved them. They made some adjustments. And so they marked it two. Now, one of the really interesting things here, you see this 780 here? Just above it, there is a W-Y. Now, that stands for West Yorkshire Regiment. The West Yorkshire Regiment is also known as the 14th Regiment of Foot. This is one of the oldest military regiments in the British Army. They actually started under James II in the 1600s. They fought in the Revolutionary War. They fought in the Napoleonic Wars. They fought in the Crimean War. They also fought in the Second Afghan War, 1878 to 1880. So this gun was almost certainly in that war. Whoa. So what do you think it's worth? The rifle in this condition with the accessories and the early date, known regiment, about $1,100. Oh, cool, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. Good luck. Health and knowledge. Thank you, sir. Anytime you have a rifle like this marked to a specific regiment, it means that there's a collector out there who really wants it. The more specific you get, uh, the chances of you finding someone who will love it increase. So what do you think? We're going to stick with $1,250. Um, you say it's worth $1,100. I'll give you $600. Uh, I'm going to say $1,000, sir. I can't. I mean, Cannot? No, I'll tell you what. I'll go seven. I have a number in my head. I would like us to both reach there. That number better be $700. $800, sir. $700. $800, sir. I, I, I literally, I really am going the best I can. 700 bucks is what makes sense to me. I'm gonna have to thank you for your time, sir. And unfortunately, we can't get a deal done today. If you change your mind, give me a call, man. Will do, sir. We couldn't see eye to eye. It happens, no worries whatsoever. But maybe I'll come back a little bit later with the bayonet, take another stab at it. A customer called the shop, and she has a knock volley gun. She lives in Boulder City, and the gun range is right in the middle, so I figured that's where we'd meet. I have never seen one of these in person, and I've been buying and selling guns for over 30 years. That is a big gun. Where in the hell did you get this? I, it's kind of a crazy story. I go to the range all the time with uh, my girls and shoot, and there's this guy, I guess, he really likes me, and he gave it to me. Okay, so, all right, I'm the weirdness here. of the world. The weirdness yeah, of the really world. Weird. It's actually a volley gun, but people now refer to it as the knock volley gun. I've actually never seen one in person, only behind some glass in a museum. They were just pure insanity. To put seven barrels in one gun, it's a shotgun on a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible gun. So have you fired this thing? I have not. I was nervous to shoot it because of the amount of kick that it probably has. Well, I, it, you literally got hit in the shoulder with a giant sledgehammer. Yeah, that actually was the chief complaint about them. They were designed, actually, for British warships. They were used in the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars. Back then, sea combat, uh, the idea was to capture the other boat. You didn't want to sink it because that was a boat that you could use in your Navy. So they get up alongside and they have boarding parties. And as the boarding parties came over the deck, these guys who had uh, these volley guns were up in the rigging and they would shoot down with seven barrels thinking that it would clear the decks. But the problem was seven barrels had a tremendous amount of recoil and the guys were actually dislocating their shoulders. And the other thing is 
with you know 100 grains of powder in each barrel that's 700 grains the the flame that came out of the end of this was like 12 feet long so they were setting their own ships on fire <laughs> so pretty quickly these went out of service okay so um it's all right with you if we shoot them yeah sure okay um i mean what's the worst could happen <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't blow up. Yeah, you need to be very careful with things like this. We have no idea what condition it's in inside. Uh, I'll take a look at it and hopefully we'll be able to shoot it. Okay. Uh, the chambers are clear, the action's working well, so I'm feeling comfortable that we can actually shoot this thing. I definitely want to shoot it. Why don't you let me shoot it? I think people will miss me less and they'll miss you. And then I don't I care when I shoot it as long as I shoot it. This is a true piece of history. I'm like, I get excited about it because I don't get to see things quite like this really ever, and you never get to shoot them. All right. All right, here we go. Here we go. I think I hit the barrel. <laughs> Alex fired it, didn't even come close to the target. So it's gonna be fun to watch Chum shoot this. <laughs> Good luck, Chum. Hope you like your fingers. That's what I'm talking about. Only one here who can hit the target. You'd have cleared the deck. Hey, it's something I'm good at. I usually clear the dance floor. <laughs> so what do these things go for? I would value this at $35,000 to $40,000. OK. I mean, what's your best price on it? Um, I would take thirty-eight dollars for it. You'd take less than that. It was a gift. I'll give you 28 for it. I have to make money. I think that's a little bit low. How about 30? You know what? I'll give you the 30 grand for it. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, just bring it with you to over to the pawn shop. We'll do okay. some paperwork, and I'll give you a check or cash or whatever you want. Sounds okay? great. Thank you so right, much. Cool. I'll see you there. OK, see you there. Cool. I got a gun, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> I feel like Santa came to town. <laughs> I think I made a great deal. I usually don't get giddy over things. I'm a little bit giddy over this gun. There's just so few of them out there. So I'm going to do all right in this. I think I'll get close to 40000 for it. What do you think, Chum? I think you're a little chicken. You should have shot it. I'm not chicken. You're definitely yellow belly. Oh, shut up, Chum. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. What do you have here? I have an awesome 1980s Coca-Cola toy. OK, it's real awesome, dude. Cool. This is a uh, GoBot. Where'd you get it? I had a birthday party in Burger King, and this was the gift that Burger King gave me. I think I'd be pretty pissed if I got this at 12 years old. Right. Like a Coke can, seriously? <laughs> I have a 1980s Coca-Cola robot. When I first got it, I tried to play with it. It was just a Coke can so it really didn't fit in with any other toys, so it just went back in the box. It's just sitting on a shelf, so I'm just trying to get rid of some clutter. My wife keeps on at me about the stupid things I keep holding on to. Let me see this here, it's pretty cool. Right. Coca-Cola advertisement, but it's also a GoBot. So, in 1984, Tonka came out with the, the GoBots, and Hasbro came out with the Transformers. It was basically the same concept, you know, they were robots that would change into a Coke can or a car or an airplane. And you know, with the Transformers, there was uh, the Autobots and the Decepticons, and they were battling for thousands of years. I don't know too much about GoBots, but basically the same thing as Transformers, but not as popular, you know. Many people look at the GoBots as Transformer knockoffs, but in reality, the GoBots were released before the Transformers. Both of them are pretty cool, but the GoBots only lasted a few years, and the Transformers just released their fourth major motion picture. This is gonna appeal to people who collect Coke, Transformers, GoBots. It is in good condition, man. Yeah. Um, well, what do you want to do with it? I wanted to try and sell it. How much are you trying to get for it? Uh, I wanted about 200. Hmm. Honestly, dude, it's a GoBot. I'm offering you 40 bucks on it. Uh, how about 150? 
Um, would you be able to do like maybe 60 bucks? 80? I could go 75 on it. Okay. 75 bucks? Yeah. All right, that's a deal. Let's go over here and write it up. Okay. I got it for free when I was a 10 year old. It sat on the shelf for about 30 years and I got 75 bucks for it. So I think that's a pretty good deal. Now we must plan the takeover of your boss's enterprise. Oh, it's been a long time since I've seen one of those. I just bought it. It's a little uh, GoBot, it's like a transformer thing. But it's, it's not a GoBot job. How do you know? Okay. It's like a transform. It transforms. Boom. Done. Chump. Yeah. What I'm trying to tell you is it was Coca-Cola just made it. It wasn't done by GoBots or anything. So what is it then? So Coca-Cola made this promotional thing in England, but there was no reason to have GoBots or Transformers do it when they could just do it themselves, and not have to pay a licensing fee or anything like that. So they just made a transforming Coke can. I just, I don't get it. But they're still cool. How much you pay for it? 75 bucks. I actually did good. I mean, we could sell it for like 150. Cha-ching. Go, go, Coke can. As long as you don't break it. <laughs> Chum, put it away. Put it on the shelf till we sell it, all right? All right. You shall live to pawn another day, Chong. How you doing? Good. What do you have here? It's an Aquatech etching by Moreau, Joan Moreau. OK. It looks really cool. Definitely. I really like Moreau. He's one of my favorite artists. It's simple, but yet your subconscious still thinks, what could this be, you know? This could be a kite. This could be a row. This could be anything, you know? Like, it really gets you thinking, what could this be? $10,000, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know a date on it or anything like that? No idea. I don't know the title, the date. All I know is it's titled 49 out of 50, so I assume it's an edition of 50. There's definitely a big market for Moreau's work. In 2012, Sotheby set a record by selling his masterpiece, the Trois Blue, for $37 million. If this piece is real, it won't fetch millions, but it could be worth thousands. So how much do you want to get for it? Uh, 12,000, that's what I was thinking. There was an art gallery downtown about 10 years ago that had similar etchings by Moreau. Okay. And uh, they were selling anywhere between forty dollars and $70,000. You know what? I can see this going for 12000 That's not out of the ballpark for a Moreau piece. The thing is, even though his artwork is worth a lot of money, he's one of the most faked artists around from this period of time. Like, his signature is faked a lot. And I'm not a signature expert, but signature looks a little iffy to me. It kind of looks like stop and go, stop and go. Moreau had a real fluid signature. I would just like someone to come down and take a look at it. I got a art expert, Brett. He's dealt with Moreau's for a long time. So give me a few minutes, and I'm going to go call him. Absolutely, sure. I'm a little nervous to hear what the expert has to say because I don't have a good baseline to know what it's worth, and I am also unsure if it's truly authentic. <laughs> Miro, Miro on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice. Jean Moreau is really one of the 20th century masters. He's right up there with Picasso and Matisse. He was a master of all media, from engravings to aqua tints to stone lithography. He could do it all. I am familiar with this image. I've actually seen this. The title is called Demi Mondaine at her window. You can see that this is a figure. You can see the eye. You can see the appendages here. And it's, it's probably a woman of the night uh, wearing a, an or, ornate uh, gown with you know, beautiful flowing colors and standing in front of a window. And it's a window view of the, the night sky. You've got the stars, the moon, or maybe these are city lights. I mean, this is really indicative of his late period work. OK. Now, did you have some specific questions, Chum? I don't know if it's real. And also, the signature is not quite as flowy as I would mm. normally see from a Moreau signature. Is it OK if we put this up on the table? You're the boss. OK, great. All right, let me take a closer look here. 
Yeah, I think what we have here is a, it's a mixed media print. I do see plate marks, which would be indicative of an engraving where they actually press the copper plate into the paper. You can see it kind of, uh, you know, the trace of it there. It's on the right type of paper, so this does appear to be an original Moreau graphic. Oh, excellent, great. Okay, now this is where I run into some issues. I have seen this work and every single one that I've seen, the signature usually appears higher up within the composition below the green, and the number typically appears below this orange sphere. The signature, I'm a little worried about. There's a lack of fluidity here. I mean, it, there's a lot of breaks in the arches of the M. I think what this might be was an original graphic that somebody else signed and numbered. Oh. <laughs> which is a shame because even an original graphic that's unsigned and unnumbered is gonna be worth many thousands of dollars. It's kind of like autographing a Mickey Mantle card yourself, you know, it loses a lot of the value. Again, I can't say with 100% authenticity, but based on my experience with this particular work in Moreau, I, I just see too many red flags to advise Chum to purchase it. All right. Sorry. All right, All bro. right. All right, nice meeting you. Yeah, same here. All right, thank you, Chum. Yep, thanks for All coming right. in. Have a good one, guys. I'm afraid I had to advise Chum to pass on the work. Even though I think the graphic itself is genuine, there's just too many question marks about the signature and the addition for me to advise him to purchase it. So, even though he thinks it's a real Moreau graphic, I'm gonna have to pass. It's gonna be hard for me to sell. It still seems kind of fictitious. I understand. All right, thank well, you. thanks for bringing it in. It was oh, a pleasure you. to look at. Yeah, thank you. It's very disappointing to hear that it's an authentic Moreau, but someone forged Moreau's signature. Now I'll probably end up hanging up the Moreau wherever we end up staying and um, enjoying it as much as I can. What do we have here? I have a bone record. Um, what is a bone record? It's an x-ray. It's like an x-ray record that, that they use for like band music back in the day. You know, it's definitely an x-ray of something, it looks like. Looks like boobs. It's not boobs. It's Maybe not I'm boobs. just seeing things. <laughs> a bone record is like a vinyl x-ray that they used to get band music on back in the 40s and 50s. I'm gonna try to sell it for 500. If I get the full 500, I am going to spend the money on recording an album for my band. I'm just sort of like baffled by it. Where did you get this thing? My grandpa. He gave it to me because I play music and I can't do anything with it. So I'm assuming it's Russian? Yes, it's from Russia. My family's actually from Russia, so. I've never heard the term bone record, but I remember hearing about how the bootleg records in Eastern Europe, they would press records on x-rays because up until the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union at the time didn't like Western culture. They weren't allowed to have Western music. This is how they sort of bootlegged them. This was the Soviet Union. You did what they told you to do, and if you had any contraband, they sent you to the gulag. You went to a work camp and worked there until you died. That was their system of government. I feel like I'm in a gulag. Not until the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 was Western music allowed in the Soviet Union. It was illegal to own any type of record-making device, recorder. It was even illegal to own a printing press or a Xerox machine. So it makes sense that they make music on an x-ray. It's kind of weird but that's the materials they had, and that's all they could do. So have you ever played their album or the no. record? No, uh, I've never played it. You have to have, like, a special record player to play it, and I, I, don't, I don't even know where to get one. Okay, so um, I'm assuming you want to sell it? Yes. And how much do you want to sell it for? 500. Um, that seems like a very arbitrary number. <laughs> yes. Do you mind if I call in my music guy? I, yeah. I, I'm just completely baffled with it. No. This is, uh, Go ahead. I mean, for all I know, it could be worth $5 or it could be worth 5000 So okay. give me a few minutes, OK? Will do. I think it's it's great that an expert comes in because I know nothing about it. So it, it'd be interesting to see what he has to say. Have you seen these things before? I've heard of them. I've never actually messed with one before. It's uh, made on an x-ray. Yeah. Yeah, it was probably Russian. Western music was illegal, so these guys would bootleg stuff. They made them on whatever material they had, and so x-rays were probably pretty regularly available. You know, bone records are kind of collectible, you know? You can get these guys that are obsessive about records and the history of it, and they're a neat thing to have in your collection that you could show you, like, oh, yeah, well, you've got that. Well, I've got one of these, you know, kind of thing. So do you think this thing will play? It might. 
I'll put it on here and play it, but it might <laughs> like cut a spiral in it or destroy it. I, I don't know if it's gonna work or not. Okay, I'll All right. go. Risk is on you guys, man. It sounds like somebody's killing somebody. Yeah, it does kind of. I can understand why the Russians were always so angry. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's probably 50 years old, so who knows what it sounded like when they first did it. It might have been pretty decent. What are these things worth? Stuff like this kind of falls in. It's, it's a copy. It's like saying, well, I got a cassette tape of the Beatles' white <laughs> album. You know what I mean? It's, that? It's, it's a copy. It's a copy. It is right, a rarity right, right, and stuff right. like that. I get it. And there aren't that many of them, but there's people asking two or 300 bucks for them, but I don't, I've don't. i never seen one sell for that much. They usually sell right around $80 or $100. That's usually what they end up selling for. OK. OK. Well, thanks, man. Yeah, I no problem, dude. Want to get an idea on it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Hope it helps. All right. Yeah. Catch you guys later. I think it's kind of a cool buy for Rick just because it's something he's never seen before. You know, it's the first one I've ever actually put my hands on. It's kind of a rare thing. Nothing else. He gets it right. It's cool to just a conversation piece in the shop. So I'll give you 30 bucks. 30? Um, jeez. He said 200, so I'd, I'd, I'd like to start there, if anything. Well, no, he said he's seen people ask as much as that, but he's seen himself for like 80 or 100 bucks. Right. Like you said, it's an oddity. It's just, it's one of those weird things. I'll tell you what, I'll give you 50 bucks and I won't give you a dime more. Um, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, sweet, you. That's good. We got a deal. Thank you. I'll meet you right over there and I'll write you up. Oh, okay. no, as a matter of fact, this guy will write you up. All right. Got it. If I would have got the 500, I would have recorded with my band, but since I'm getting 50, I'm just going to go buy an album at the store. What do we got? Got a couple of guitars for you DC Comics, John Bolin, Batman, and Joker guitars. Set. Oh, wow. This one's even more impressive. Joker. I didn't know the Joker could play guitar. <laughs> Cool. John Bolin, I mean, he basically became the guy, if you wanted a badass custom guitar, that you went to. And this guy's got a really interesting story. He went down and apprenticed to, I believe it was Gibson or one of them, and decided that that's what he wanted to do with his life. And he started making custom-made acoustics for his friends and friends of friends. And then you know, one day, he ended up making one for some folk singer. And then Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top is what really, really put him on the map. And then I think he made him for just about everybody that wanted a really high-end custom guitar. Right. When it comes to making custom guitars, Bolin is the guy you go to. And everybody from Joe Perry to Steve Miller have had this guy make them for him. So if this is legit, we're not looking at your average guitar here. But Batman and Joker, I didn't know that he made them, though. The cool thing about the Joker is it also has this little chip in it. And if you push this button when it's all hooked up to a, a amplifier, you push that and the Joker laughs. It's like, ha, 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 Really cool. That is cool. Yeah, that's unique. Yeah, ever since the success of the Star Wars and how much money they made from licensing stuff, every movie they could license out stuff did. And with the Batman stuff, it, you know, there was no exception there. I just didn't know that they would be rolling guitars. Kind of unique, right? Yeah. So what are you looking to get for them? I want to get 15000 for them. OK, for the pair? For the pair. OK. This is a little out of my realm, I got to tell you, man. We're talking about really high-end guitars in a really niche market, and it just it would make me a little more comfortable if I called a buddy of mine to come down and take a look at them. Understood. All right, why don't you hang out, and I'll be back in a little bit. Sounds good. When he called for an expert, I thought it was great, because I think that these guitars speak for themselves. I know I have all my paperwork done, and the guitars are solid. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, what's up, Jesse? I got a... Um, I got two guitars, uh, John Bolin, Batman, and Joker. I don't, uh, I don't really know much about them. You think you can come down and take a look at them? Well, if, if, if they're legit, they're probably anywhere from for the pair, 7,500 to 8,500. But um, you know, I can't make it down there. But I, I got, a, I got somebody that can come down there. I'll, I'll send him down here with you guys' way. Right on, man. I appreciate it. Cool, man. No problem. Dude. I'll talk to you soon. All right, all right. 
Jesse sent me, John Bolin. Oh, wow. John Bolin, OK. Um, the John Bolin? I am. Oh, wow. Looks like a couple of my guitars here. <laughs> That's a, what a treat. Well, I guess you'd be the guy to talk to about these then, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. I made these 26 years ago. Wow. My name is John Bolin, and I'm the owner of Bolin Guitars, and I'm a guitar maker known as a luthier. My buddy Jesse knew I was in town, gave me a call, and he said, hey, you won't believe this. They've got a pair of your Batman and Joker at a pawn shop. You gotta go down and see them. They are absolutely beautiful. My lord. Pretty much looks to me like they're unplayed. So how'd this all come about? Well, it started with the Batman. This was to celebrate the Batman movie. And um, we did the prototype, and at that point, we make a lot of guitars for ZZ Top, and the word got out to Billy that we were doing this, and he was like, oh, I have got the perfect design for the Joker. So Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top designed this? He did. That's awesome, man. I brought an amp out. I'm kind of curious to hear the Joker laugh. <laughs> It's a seven second loop, so you. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, you're the guy to ask, are they legit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think my fingernail marks are on there somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming down. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Corey. So, you wanted 15,000. Bad news is, I can't have a. John Bowling gave me the price of the guitars because he built them, and I'm sure to him they're priceless. Okay. So I uh, I did talk to my buddy on the phone, and he told me that they'd probably retail for about 7,500 for the pair. You know, we're we're so far off. I mean, you want 15,000? I mean, I'll, I'll go 7,500 for them. I, I know a Batman sold for 7,500 by itself once. I definitely would not sell them for $7,500. Yeah, and that's going to be the most I can pay. Um, but I really appreciate it, man. It was fun. Yeah, Thank it was. You. Thanks so much. Um, if you hurry up, you might be able to catch them and get them to <laughs> sign them for you out there if you want. Thank you. Take care. There's no way I could take $7,500. I've seen one alone sell for $7,500. We're going to hop in the Batmobile and head out of here. Hey, how's it going? Good. How you doing? What do we got? This is a Tori Hanzo sword signed by David Carradine, who played Bill in the movie Kill Bill. Sweet. Love the movie. David Carradine played the uh, head of a group of assassins. They all had really weird names, uh, Black Mamba. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole snake thing was just kind of silly. Yeah. <laughs> These swords were signed by David Carradine probably about 10 or 11 years ago. I used to collect swords, but now they're just collecting dust. I'm looking to get about 2200 I want to sell these swords because I'm hoping some collector who loves the movies, who loves Kill Bill, can properly display them in some beautiful place. Kill Bill. Couldn't have came at a better time for David Carradine. The guy was pretty much broke. Uh, Quentin Tarantino just happened to be a Kung Fu fan and pretty much offered him a role. He didn't really get paid all that much for it, but it kind of brought him back into the limelight where people were actually paying him to sign swords and do signings again. Yeah. Kill Bill was originally just supposed to be one film, but by the time Tarantino was done, the movie was four hours, so the studio released it in two different parts. That ended up being a really good decision because both films killed it at the box office. So, nerd replicas. Yeah, this one is the demon sword, which was Bill's sword, and this one is the bride's rampage sword. Okay, do you mind if I take a look at them? No, go ahead. Okay, the swords aren't really much, man. They're made in China. And the blade's made to look like it's tempered. It's not really tempered. No, I agree. What are you looking to do with them? I'm selling. Okay. Um, any idea of how much you want for them? Twenty-two hundred. Okay, that's uh, that's quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that before he died, these were going for about eighty bucks a piece. So I'll tell you what. Let me have a buddy of mine from a PSA come down and. He knows the autograph world better than anybody, and he can tell me if, since he's died, if they've gone up that much or what the deal is, all right? All right. I'll be right back. All right, sounds good. I think it's great that an expert's being called in because I'll get the signatures authenticated, and I might learn some more things about this piece. Well, I got some signed David Carradine swords.
Oh, cool. Um, when you talk about like the 70s cult classic type actors, you know, he was a you know B movie guy. He did over 100 movies. Ended up being pretty popular. I mean, he had the whole kung fu thing. And then once Kill Bill came out, his popularity went insane for a few years. And then he ends up dying in a strange way. Yeah. But you know, people still are really into this guy. David Carradine carries a little weight within the autograph community. I mean, he kind of went through a period where no one really cared about him, and then he went through a big explosion where he got popular again after Kill Bill. He was really fan-friendly, so there's still plenty of it out there in the marketplace. What are your concerns, Corey? I've had the David Carradine signed Hattori Hanzo replicas. Before he died, they were going for like 80 bucks. I don't know what they're worth now. Well, yeah, that's usually the thing. As when somebody passes away, their signature ends up going up in value. I just want to do a few things. Want to just take a look at the signatures, make sure they're alive. All right, that's the first one. Um, second one, same kind of exact pattern on there. Definite live. There's no doubt about that. Looks like a Sharpie. Uh, the next thing I want to do is just take a look at a couple examples of his signature. Um, the guy was pretty sloppy when he signed, so very simple. You could see here an authentic example. I see this big D here, and I'm starting with that. You get the heavy lean. He curls in on both of these seeds, and it's just kind of sloppy. So live ink, no problem with that. Signatures match perfectly. Definitely authentic, no doubt about that. OK. So what do you think they're worth? Well, are these rare? No. Are they cool? Absolutely. Um, I put the value as a pair of these right about $600. You know, it's better than what it was. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. Good to see <laughs> you there. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate good luck. It. Thanks. The thing with the swords is I would classify them as manufacturer memorabilia. They're really neat looking pieces, and they look like the ones they use in the movie, but it's just kind of a manufactured piece, and he sat down and signed them in a production line. So they're really not that rare. They're just kind of cool. It's a pretty big jump to 2200 <laughs> yeah. man. Um, yeah, sure What are you is. willing to take? Uh, you know, it's unfortunate. I didn't, I didn't really expect them to be worth so little. You know, I would give you like 200 bucks for him. Yeah, I don't know. I was thinking like you know, 1,200 would be like my bottom, you know? 1,200, I... We're not gonna be able to make a deal, man. Right. I appreciate you I coming I appreciate down. it, thanks. Take Have care. a good one. $200, that's just way too low. I mean, I understand where they're coming from, but in my opinion, these are worth much, much more. Hey, how can I help you? Hey, I brought a menu from 1876 from a dinner to honor William Sharon of the Comstock load. Can you read that? I can't read cursive. Um, some sort of Chablis. Chablis. Consume Royale. It's obviously a French menu. So what would happen when you wanted to change the menu? <laughs> <laughs> it's a silver menu to honor a famous senator from Nevada. I'm selling the menu for $10,000, but the least I would take is around $6,000. If I'm able to sell the menu today, I'll probably take that money and use it to buy more cool stuff. It's really interesting. Where did you get it? I bought it at an auction. Uh, came from an estate. OK. To the honorable William Sharon by his old friends of the Comstock Load Palace Hotel. William Sharon was a senator from Nevada. The Comstock Load? It's one of the greatest stories in American history. There was a guy named Comstock, and he came across a few guys mining. Comstock rides up on his horse, and he's going, well, you're on my property. But Comstock was really, really reasonable. What he told him was, is, listen, guys, let's start drop a contract. You guys can keep half of it. I get the other half since it's my property. They all signed it. He went on his way, rode his horse into Carson City, went to the local claim office, and claimed the land. <laughs> cool. <laughs> The Comstock Load was the original silver find in Nevada. It created a silver rush. That's what made Nevada a state and actually helped finance the Civil War. So how much are you looking to get out of it? 10 grand. OK, $10,000. How did you come up with that number? I looked around and found some auction records, and some are high and some are low, but it seems like the auctions that play to a Western collector audience get more than that. Let me get a friend of mine down here. He knows everything there is to know about Nevada history. And let me see if there's something astronomical about it that I'm not seeing, OK? Yeah, fair enough. I'll be right back. Hey, Rick, if you're calling MHP, tell him to bring down some French fries, maybe some French dressing. My fault I didn't ask him to bring French fries with French dressing. You do French dressing on French fries? 
She was in the mood for some French. <laughs> so what do we have? Uh, this is the tray I was telling you about. Oh, yes, OK. Honorable William Sharon by his old friends with the Comstock load. William Sharon ended up in charge of the Bank of California, and he ended up being able to control the Comstock and made huge amounts of money and ended up buying a Senate seat. In 1876, he was a senator from Nevada living in San Francisco and not bothering to show up in Washington very often. He was considered probably the worst U.S. senator ever. Okay. Sharon was one of the major investors in the Palace Hotel where the dinner was held. And this is the sort of piece that you might get from a very high-end dinner of the era. What we have here was a plate that would be a commemorative. Everybody who went to the dinner got one of these. Okay. Um, yeah, but there was only you know, 20, 25 people at the dinner. The one thing about this one is that it's been modified. Originally, this was a flat piece. Probably a jeweler has bent it here, added the feet to it, so it could be maybe a, a card tray, something like that. OK. Is there anything astronomical about this? It's cool. I mean, it's a piece that ties back to a really important character in Nevada and California history. It's not unique, but there are not many of them left. I've only seen one other one, and not many of them would have been made to begin with. OK. OK. You're Glad the best, man. Not a problem. Pizza afterwards? I guess you didn't bring me french fries. We better get sure. something. <laughs> You know, if the shop buys it, it is an interesting piece, and it looks to be absolutely original and absolutely correct. The reason I called Mark down was because you wanted $10,000 for this, and I just want to find out if there was something I was missing. For $10,000, you can get gold coins made in the Carson City Mint. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a lot rarer, cooler things you can get. I mean, you have a, it's a pretty interesting piece of, of Nevada history, but it's not $10,000. I mean, you have right around $100 worth of silver here. I mean, I'd give you like 200 bucks for it. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to go ahead and maybe put it in auction. I think I'll stand a better chance like that. OK. Well, have a good one, man. Yep, thanks. Thanks for bringing it in. Let's go get that pizza. I'm not eating with you. It's a shame I couldn't sell the silver menu today, but every cloud has a silver lining, and I'm going to go elsewhere with it. Hey, how can I help you? Make me a rich man. So you want me to make you a rich man by buying this? Of course. Rossler and Faye self-lighting and extinguishing lanterns. Patented May 18th, 1858. I've asked around people who deal in old things like that. No one has ever seen another one like it. OK. Well, it looks like you both deal with old things. Maybe you should go have a drink together. <laughs> Today, I brought in self-lighting and extinguishing lantern from 1858. I bought the lantern in a sale in Huntington, West Virginia. I can't find any evidence that it was ever actually produced commercially. So I'm assuming that because I have one, that it must be the patent model. Hey, it's pretty interesting. It's uh, the patent thing is neat. Is it a big deal to get the patent? Well, back then it was. I mean, this is 1858, and this is patent number 20,302. So that's 65 years in, and we got 20,000 patents. Yeah, we're only at 10 million or so today. Yeah. They just didn't issue that many patents back then. I mean, it was probably in, uh, in 1858. I'd be surprised if they did 1,000 patents that year. Nowadays, there's over, well over 1,000 patents a day submitted to the patent office. And it was innovation like this that um, changed the world. It really did. This oh. was the original flashlight. All right, well, my phone comes with a flashlight now, so you can keep it. <laughs> In the 1800s, the self-lighting lantern was a pretty revolutionary idea. It used to be a pain to light a lantern on a windy day. This, you just pressed a button and it was lit. And patent models are really collectible. But I don't even know if that's what we're looking at. What do you want to do with it? I kind of like to sell it. How much you want for it? About $2,000. <sighs> so how do you know this is a patent model? <clears throat> Um, just because the tag's on it doesn't necessarily mean it's the patent model, OK? I have no proof. OK. I just have decades of knowledge. OK. It, it's really, really cool, and it might be the patent model. I mean, but uh, I'd want a patent letter or something with it, and 
I don't have that. It didn't come with it, or I would have brought it. Okay. I'm going to pass on it because I just, I, you know, you're asking a lot of money, and if I go to resell it, I got to be sure it's a patent model, and I'm not. Okay. All right. Thanks for bringing it in. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of sad that I didn't get what I wanted, but it's something that probably belongs in a museum, and it's probably where it will wind up. Hey, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. I have a couple of interesting notes I think you may be interested in. I have a $50 legal tender note from 1880, and I have an 1890 legal tender treasury note, which is also known as an ornate or a fancy back. OK, these are cool. And they're pretty damn rare. This note is legal tender at its face value in payment for all debts, public and private. I'm, I'm impressed you can even read that. I pay extra money so you don't see the line on the bifocals. <laughs> <laughs> The notes I'm selling are very high grade. They're very collectible. The cool thing is that notes are really portable artwork. You can take them and show them other people. I'm looking for $35,000. The least I'm willing to take for them is somewhere between twenty dollars and $25,000. These things are great. These were precursors to the Federal Reserve, more or less, to our, our modern money. These were not backed by anything. They just printed them. But what gave them value is, is you could pay taxes with them. and. You didn't pay taxes. They take everything you have and throw you in jail. <laughs> I hear okay. that. So where did you get these? On the internet. I was intrigued by the backs more than the fronts. It's a greenback. Yeah. I just love everything about these. The original term greenback came from legal tender notes because they always printed them with greenbacks. Green we used to make some really, really pretty money. We did. Gorgeous. These bills are incredible. These things rarely come on the market. So I'd be shocked if one of them came in my shop, much less two of them. They're just cool. How much are we looking to get out of them? $35,000. OK. Um, 18000 for the ornate back, 17000 for the $50 note. OK. Tell you the truth, I have no idea if that's a great price or not. Let me call on someone to look at them, and we'll go from there. That's fair. OK, I'll be right back. Okay. I really feel good about an expert coming in, because I've been out of the market for a while. But I think what really helped me make a more informed decision as to selling the notes. Wow. This is why I call you in when I have this weird stuff. Great well, paper money. These are two very fantastic items. Uh, I could tell right off the bat, this was an 1890 $20 legal tender. This series is far better and more valuable and rarer than the 1891. The government felt that it was easier to counterfeit a more ornate back, which is bizarre. So in 1891, it didn't have the intricacies that this note clearly does. $50, surprisingly, even though it is a higher denomination note, it is actually more common than this note. Doesn't mean it's worth less or more, it just means it's more common. The collector basis for both notes are quite significant. Rick, what are your questions you have with this? Okay, it's the same I have with all this old paper money. You know, I need to know what grade it is and, you know, what's it worth? Okay, it's an excellent question. I'm gonna use my light because these look to be in fantastic condition actually it does have a corner fold i don't know if you can quite yeah. see it okay so I'm you notice that but i'll put this in the class of about uncirculated so this 50 dollars is quite nice um, but it does look like something fuzzy was up here some ink or a pencil someone definitely got a little creative uh, or tried to be so what are they worth okay the uh, the 20 dollar treasury note i would expect in auction to bring between twelve and sixteen thousand, and the eighteen eighty fifty dollar legal tender note, I would expect to bring between ten and fifteen thousand okay. on a conservative basis. Somewhere between twenty two and thirty, basically. Uh, that's about right. I think that sounds reasonable. No, I'm glad to hear that. No, oh, thanks, man. Thanks, Rick. Good to see you. Some of the rarest of rare notes actually is a eighteen ninety thousand dollar treasury bank note that have sold upwards of three, nearly three and a half million dollars. If Rick can negotiate a deal for both these notes, I think it's an excellent buy. What's your best price on them? I'd like to get 30000 for the two of them. Take more 17 They're absolutely beautiful, and when they're this nice, they sell quick. I'll give you that. I, th I think you can get the 30 for it. Um, 25 I'll, th I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you at the bottom end of what Pete said. 22 I think I'm, I think I'll do all right. Fine. You got a deal. Sweet. 
Meet you right over there, and we'll do some paperwork, man. I'm taking the $22,000 because at the end of the day, that's a number that I can deal with, and I'm going to look for another collection. So right now, it'll sit pretty in the bank account until that time comes. Hey, how can I help you? I have a special volume of poetry in this book, Four Quartets by T.S. Eliot. That's cool. Is it a first edition or something? Well, or? it's more than a first edition. I think it's the true first edition. OK. He was the master poet of the first half of the 20th century. He was the what poet? A master poet. OK, I thought you said a different word. All right. I hope not. <laughs> I bought this book in a local thrift store. This book is special to me because T.S. Eliot was one of the most renowned poets of the 20th century. I'd like to sell the book because I think it needs to be in the hands of someone who really appreciates it. This is really neat. When he was alive, he was considered the greatest American poet. And some people consider him like the greatest American poet we ever had. I know that he had like a really eclectic education. He went to Harvard, he went to Europe, he studied Sanskrit. Um, it is really, really embarrassing. I've never read T.S. Eliot. Uh -huh. T.S. Eliot considered Four Quartets his best work and his masterpiece. In the 1940s, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I mean, that's how big this guy was. So what makes it a true first edition? The true first says first American edition, and there were only about seven or 800 of those printed. As I understand it, Elliot didn't like the looks of the book or the typeset or something, and they just stopped distributing them. So there's only that many that were ever issued with first American edition written. OK. So how much do you want for it? $3,000. OK, I have no idea if that's a good price or not. And the condition of the dust cover really worries me. But I do have a friend who will know everything about this. Great. And who's probably read everything T.S. Eliot has ever done five times. <laughs> so I'm going to give her a call and get her down here, and she'll help us out with it. I can't wait. OK. <laughs> I'll be right back. I figured you would absolutely love this. You were right. <laughs> She says it's a first edition, first state. I recognize it immediately. It actually has four different sections. And they were released individually in the 30s. And then this came out in America during the war. Because it's a wartime publication, there are some issues with it. A lot of people who were specialists in different jobs, they were out on the front. And they had people working in jobs that they weren't as familiar with. So you see a lot of problems that show a little bit of amateurism. And you see that here, these margins, it's not right. So there's faulty printing with this. And in fact, because of the faulty printing, they actually pulled the run. However, they had to keep a certain amount of copies out in circulation to preserve the copyright. OK. So they kept 788 copies. This is one of those copies. So what's it worth? If you were going to make this sellable, you would probably need to restore the dust jacket. You're looking at an investment of $300 to $600 just to restore the dust jacket. So with that in mind, um, a copy of this that's restored, I would say you're looking at $2,250 to $2,500. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Elliot is very well respected, and he changed poetry. If the shop can negotiate a deal, then I think it's a good buy. Elliot is always going to be important, and that's not a bad investment. It really is a kind of one of a kind, even with its flaws. I know that, OK? But you also have to realize, if I buy the book off you, I have to spend the money to get these repaired. The best I can give you is $1,000 for it. Condition is very, very important. How about $1,500? I'll tell you what, I'll do $1,100, because any other price makes no economic sense to me, none. All right, $1,100. OK, 
Okay, cool, thanks. Thank you. Come on over here and we'll write this up. I bought this book at a thrift store for 75 cents, and I just sold it for $1,100. So it's a very good day for me. What do we have here? I have here my uh, antique space explorer toy. Cool. This is a Marx 10 toy. Slowly through the years, there's been like this massive collector community for things like this, especially to find one of these things in great shape. This yeah. is something little boys played with, and um, you know how little boys are. We destroy everything. Uh <laughs> That's right. That's right. I still do sometimes. It's an awesome piece. I love the litho. It runs. It does everything the toy's supposed to do. I'm hoping for $3,000 today. The antique toy is worth so much because of its rarity. I cannot find anything on this piece, um, and I have tried to look everywhere. This is pretty damn cool. You know much about the Marks Toy Company? Not too much, no. They were literally like the biggest toy company in the world. They've been around since the 1920s. They were like the first guys to go to like Japan and Hong Kong and start making the, the stamped out metal toys. This was like the early Japanese stuff right after World War II. Right. If you look at pictures of Japan right after World War II, just about everything was bombed out. Right. And uh, they were looking for, you know, being able to manufacture things with what they had left. And inexpensive toys made out of sheet metal was their thing. After World War II, one of the things the Japanese manufacturing base made was inexpensive metal toys. And quite frankly, the quality was pretty bad, so they didn't last long. So it's absolutely amazing to see one in this kind of shape. So how much you want for it? Well, I looked all over the place for this, and I found in an old toy magazine where it was listed for $5,500. Now, that's with the box, of course, but I figured 3000 would be a good price to ask for. OK. This is one of the holy grails. This is one of the big ones. And this looks like it's beat up a little bit, but this is in incredible shape. I think I know enough about this thing. When you saw a price for 5500 that is with the box. Right. Okay? And I'm just telling you, that's 100 times more rare, especially for a toy like this. I'll give you 1000 bucks for it. You know, and when it comes to toys, it comes to anything like this. Condition is everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's, it's an incredible shape, I'll give you that, but it's definitely not perfect. Right. 1750? No. I'll give you 1200 bucks. I have to resell this thing, okay? Right. They are very collectible, but maybe one out of 20,000 people collect old sheet metal toys, right. and then you gotta find someone willing to pull that kind of money out of their pocket. Did you do 1300? <sighs> Let me do 1250. Sure. All right. All right, thanks, man. I'll meet you right over there and uh, we'll do some paperwork. Okay. okay, thanks. I think I knew enough about this toy to make a good deal. Like I always say, a little bit of knowledge can be a really dangerous thing. So I'm gonna bring it down to Johnny just to ease my mind. Hey, dude, what's up? Hey, what's up, Rich? Look what I bought. Oh, sweet, man. Old Limewar toy. Uh-huh. It's all there. It's in really good shape. Wow. Every time you come, it's something better and better. These are part of pop culture in the 50s and 60s. You know, every little kid would have been exposed to that on the news with the space race going on. So, you know, kids had ray guns, and then they had tin robots, and then, of course, little space vehicles. This is part of pop culture from back then. So I tried to call you to come down to the shop, but you weren't there. So I bought it. I think I made a good deal on it. And I just wanted to see what you thought it was worth. Cool. Well, let me take a closer look. In the collector world, these are enormously popular. Collectors go nuts for these. And this is definitely you know, up there as far as some of the rare tin toys from that era. All of the colors are really bright. I mean, look at the red on the astronaut. The nose is clean. Um, what I like the most about this, this is a friction toy. So, I mean, young boys would have just been revving it up all day long, and that whole bottom surface is just gorgeous. So what'd you pay for this? 12.50. And if I lose money, it's your fault because you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something, man. I mean, with the condition that it's in, 
You could sell this easily for $2,500. Cool, man. So you'll do well with this. Thanks, man. All right, anytime. All right, man. All right. It's really risky for Rick to buy a toy without me seeing it, but Rick definitely did a great buy. It's super rare and condition was great. He should have no problem selling it in the shop. What we got there? Beer? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's empty. I drank it on the way over. <laughs> that. Well, I came to the pawn shop today to sell an American pewter tankard. And I believe it's made at 1730 to 1750. I'd like to ask $20,000 for it. I think it's worth a lot more. The lowest price I could probably take is about 13000 What exactly is this? It was made before the American Revolutionary War by a very famous pewter, and it's a pretty darn rare piece. It is cool, though. I mean, I really do dig it. Tankers became really popular in Europe and eventually in the New World, starting in the 1500s. They were basically the original beer mug, and they're mostly made out of pewter. They could be worth a lot of money, depending on where and when they were made. It was the only really viable metal for dishes, besides maybe like silver or gold, but that was way too expensive to make dishes out of. And um, when our immigrants started coming over here in the 1600s, 1700s, we didn't have a lot of craftsmen, and most pewter stuff we would just import from England. Um, the English sort of discouraged manufacturing in the States, mm -hmm. sort of why we had a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> if this is pre-revolutionary pewter, it's worth a ridiculous amount of money. Yes. How much were you looking to get out of this? Well, I was thinking about 20000 Let me have someone take a look at it, because it's sure. not that I don't trust you. It's just anything like this from this period is being faked or has been faked. So let me get him down here. He'll take a look at it, and then we'll go from there, OK? You got it. Hang out a few minutes. OK. Hey, I'll be right back. I have no problem with an expert coming in. This is a genuine piece. There's no question in my mind. So I'd like an expert to confirm that. Good to see you. Howdy, my name is Mark. Hi, I'm Bill. Bill, good to, good to meet you. Okay, we have, this is what he says is a pre-revolutionary war American pewter tankard. That's nice. Very few early pieces, especially pre-revolutionary war pieces from America survive today. The standard lifespan of a plate or a porringer was only about 10 years. You know, and then it would get melted down and recast. You mind if I take a closer look please, at it? Please, please. OK. It's an interesting piece. When you're looking at a piece like this, what you want to see is how much of it is original and how much of it isn't. There's been a lot of work done on this. The handle, at least, has been reattached, if not replaced. The lid, I believe, has been replaced. The one piece that is really the, the final criteria on this is the touch mark appears to be I.B. That would be John Bassett. OK. When you're looking at pre-Revolutionary War American pewter, John Bassett is one of the people that you look for. And he is a highly collected name in pre-Revolutionary War pewter. Is that what his mark looks like? Yeah. I did see one other John Bassett touch mark, uh, but it was in a book. It was a photograph of a touch mark. Uh, unfortunately, on this one, I cannot tell you that it's an original John Bassett. OK. Thanks, man. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. <laughs> OK, take care. Very good Thanks. to meet you. OK. When I first looked at this tankard, I saw that it is touch marked. But that is one of those very rare touch marks that I would want to look at next to another original to see whether it actually matches. I wish I could make you an offer and this wasn't so anticlimactic, but no thanks for coming in, man. OK, take care. Thank you. Well, I'm feeling a little disappointed in the fact that he could not confirm that it was real. I'm sure it's real. He can't be an expert in everything. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you guys? I brought my shower curtain in today. <laughs> it's kind of creepy. It's yeah. even creepier <laughs> because it's signed by Anthony Perkins. The basketball player? <laughs> no, no, the psycho dude. Reek, 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 reek. I won the shower curtain in San Diego uh, on a contest, and Anthony Perkins signed it when he showed up to give a speech about directing uh, Psycho 3. I want to sell the shower curtain because I need a little extra money and uh, it's a decent item. 
I'm gonna ask uh, $400, but I think the least I would take would be three. This is deeply, deeply cool. Is it just me or is it weird that you got a shower curtain autographed? Well, it has to do with the whole Psycho thing. Did you ever see the original movie Psycho? No. There's a movie came out, I think it was 1960. Hitchcock directed it. It has the most iconic horror flick scene in it ever. There was a shower scene where supposedly Hitchcock took a week to film that. You never actually saw her stabbed. You just saw the blood going down the drain. That doesn't sound very scary. It was incredible. The way it was filmed is considered like a cinematic masterpiece thing. It was like the scariest movie ever. It's iconic. The shower scene in the original Psycho was radical to the extreme during its time. Anyone who originally saw that at the movies was looking over their shoulder before they got in the shower. OK, so how much do you want for this? Mm, 400. <sighs> it's not a photo. It's something a little bit more unique. Uh, to tell you the truth, it actually sounds like a reasonable price. I just want to make sure it's his signature in his hand. Just hang out 15 minutes. I'll get a guy down here, and I want him to look at this, all right? Sure. I'll be right back. This is my shower curtain expert. Yeah. All righty. Just started. This is my shower curtain. Very cool. So he died in 1992. It's definitely an unconventional item to see signed by him. And rarely, and this is a good thing about him, rarely see anything on him. So when you tell me you have a shower curtain signed by this guy, it sounds kind of far-fetched. OK. Well, you know, Anthony Perkins, I mean, he had started some really big movies, and he was very well thought of in Hollywood. But this one movie, Psycho, obviously, that kind of put him on the map. It's one of the most historically significant films in movie history. So is it legit? Well, OK, two things I want to do. First is the ink. That's pretty interesting. It actually looks like blood. <laughs> Here's an authentic version of a signature, and we see some of these similarities here. The two most important things in a signature were his A and his H, and they both kind of dominate his autograph. The next thing he underlines, as you could see in this example. OK. So based on everything I see here, Rick, no question, this was signed by him. And I'm being honest, this is one of the coolest pieces I've actually seen come in here. There's no doubt about it. I mean, you never see something like this ever. This item is awesome. OK, so what's it worth? Photographs, three, four hundred. Vintage stuff, five, six hundred dollars. With that said, this is something I'd value right around the eight hundred to thousand dollar range easily. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. There's no question about this piece being a great buy. Now, if Rick's able to get it for the store, that thing would sell in a heartbeat. So 400 bucks is a deal. Yeah. <laughs> Would you be willing to go six? Well, you wanted four well, a little while ago. That was before I listened to your expert. Probably should have never called him in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Um, I'll go 500 bucks. 500? Hold on. What do you think, Mother? <laughs> I don't think Mother likes your bid. <laughs> Would you go 550? I still have to get it framed up. I still have to do a lot of stuff to sell it. 500 bucks. I think Mother will take your offer. Cool. Write him up, chum. I don't know what Mother's doing, but come on, let's go. <laughs> Thanks. I think Mother's pretty ticked at me for settling for such a low price, but I'm going to take the money and buy myself some new musical instruments. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? What do you have here? I brought you Bob Hope his original comic from 1950. Hey, Rick. What? Check this out. It's a Bob Hope comic book. Oh, that's pretty cool. Do you know who Bob Hope is? The Price is Right. No, that's Bob Barker. This is Bob Hope. Different old Bob. You know, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, like Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin. Who? Like Harold and Kumar. OK. All right, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Hope, he was a pretty amazing guy. He entertained troops in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. He was the only honorary veteran in the United States because he did so much stuff for the USO. Lived to be 100 years old. 100? Yep. And when he was in a movie, it made money. He was so popular, he had his own comic book. Sweet. Bob Hope was an absolute Hollywood legend. He was in over 70 films, and he hosted the Academy Awards 19 times. I'm just afraid anyone under the age of 50 doesn't really know who he is. 
So, um, where did you get this? I actually got this on an online auction. Okay, well, it looks in relatively good shape. I'm assuming you want to sell it? Yes. How much you want for it? I, I believe it might be worth about $500. I don't know how collectible Bob Hope is, to tell you the truth. I just have no idea what the demand would be for this. Due to the fact that it's not an action hero, it's Bob Hope. It's a little right. weird. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind if I have someone look at it? That'd be great. I have a friend in town. Yeah, okay, he grades comics for a living. He knows what he's doing. I'll be right back. I'll give him a call, and um, we'll go from there. Great. I'm glad an expert's coming in to look at the comic just to be sure that it's all there and to get their opinion on the grade. Ah, a Bob Hope number one. I mean, the, the whole weird thing is it's Bob Hope. It's not like he's a superhero. Yeah, in the 50s, superheroes were going down. They, they weren't as popular. And so what DC started to do is license celebrities. They did stories in here that would relate to some of the movies coming out. So they kind of did some cross-marketing there. OK. The Bob Hope comic ran from issue one from 1950 all the way to 1968. I mean, 18 years for, for a continual run on a comic is pretty great. So what's the grade on this thing? All right, well, it looks pretty nice. It's got a few creases, tear along the spine there. Doesn't look restored at all. A little bit of tanning, the chip out at the top right. You know, I think CGC would give it about a 6.0. The big question is, what's it worth? That would put a certified 6.0 price at around $600. That's the price, but are they easy to sell? I mean, most people my age, we, we know Bob Barker more than we know Bob Hope. Told you. So you're calling me old? No, you are old. I'm just stating a fact. <laughs> anyway, I think at $600, you can't go wrong. OK. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you it. You got it, Rick. Anytime. All right. Good to see you again. See you next time. Take care. People love first issues. Issue ones always are collectible. How fast Rick will sell it, I really can't say. I know he gets a lot of foot traffic through the shop, and, and I think he should be able to move it. So what's your best price of this? Well, if it's worth six and I'm only asking five, I hope that's a great deal for Bob. I think Bob would say the price is going to have to be right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your problem here is it's Bob Hope. I mean, unless you're over 50, no one really knows who Bob Hope is anymore. I think it's going to be a tough sell. I'll give you 300 bucks for it. How about $400? I'll give you 325 and I won't go a penny more. I mean, it literally is it. Congratulations. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> the price is right. <laughs> All right, let's go write it up. I believe it was a win-win for that particular price. I'm going to give the money to my wife, and I have no idea what the hell she's going to do with it. <laughs> what are you laughing at? This is Bob Hope comic. Bob Hope comic book? Hey, you know Bob Hope. It's like, did New Year's Eve for like years and years and years. He's got the airport named after him in California. That was Dick Clark's Rocking Eve. It's not Dick Clark International Airport. I know, it's Bob Hope International Airport. Never mind. I'm just telling you, those old comedians have nothing on the new wave of comedians. Why is it that all you guys ever want to do is argue with me? You're always saying I refuse to learn anything. I learned that Bob Hope and Dick Clark aren't the same person. No kidding. Maybe you'll grow a brain one day. Coming from the guy reading comics. Old Bob Hope comics. <laughs> Hello. What in the world is this? This is my Starkey egg chair. OK, what's that? It was originally used as a hearing test chair. It's really cool. It has speakers inside. I don't know, dude. It looks pretty Dr. evil -ish. You think your dad could sit in it? Yes. Fits him perfect. We'll get him a little naked cat. <laughs> <laughs> I came into the pawn shop today to sell my Starkey egg chair. A Starkey egg chair is a hearing test chair used by audiologists to test people's hearing back in the 80s. Uh, if I'm able to make a deal, I will spend my money on a trip to Italy with my husband. Ciao. This looks cool. So they would use them basically to help sell hearing aids and do ear tests on people. Yes. And then they came out with noise canceling headphones and way easier, way more portable. Pretty much. 
So does it work still or? Yes, it does. Do you have a phone we can plug in? Uh, yeah. Okay. You need music? Yes. And then sit in the chair. Does it sound any different or? I can't hear anything. <laughs> All right, we can, we've heard enough. <laughs> Get out of the chair. I, I can't hear you. Are you can see me? Get out of the chair. Dude, this thing is sweet. The egg chair got designed in the 60s, but most people today recognize it from the movie Men in Black. This particular model was designed for a hearing test, but it is kind of funky and it does have surround sounds, so I'm pretty sure someone will buy it. So, what are you looking to do with it? I am looking to sell it. What are you looking to get out of it? I'm asking a thousand. That might be a little much. <laughs> okay. Um, would you take 500? I would take 750. Sounds like you'll take 500. I will take 750. 700? 725. No. <laughs> 700. All right, Jill. <laughs> Jim, you wanna write it up? Um, or you could write it up and I can listen to music. All right, come with me. Okay. $700 isn't exactly what I wanted for the chair, but I'll take it. Pack your bags, we're going to Italy. Ciao.